Welcome to On the Edge with Deneen Dias. Today, my guest is Jen Wilson. Jen, will you please introduce yourself? Well, I sure will, Deneen. Uh, I'm glad to be here, first of all, so thanks for inviting me in. I'm Jennifer Wilson, Convergence Coaching. I'm co-founder and partner of this 22-year-old business. It's completely virtual, completely flexible. All of our assets in the cloud back when there was dial-up and not, it wasn't called the cloud. <laughs> it was very inefficient. Open PTO for 22 years, all to, also unlimited PTO. Um, and we are a leadership and management consulting firm. We focus only on the accounting space. And uh, and I'm just thrilled to be here with you and Botkeeper today. Thank you. Well, so Jen, I've known you for years and I've had the great pleasure to be able to see you speak for years at lots of conferences. And so I appreciate you spending time talking to me today because what you focus on is the number one biggest issue facing firms. Now, I should say it's been the number one biggest issue facing firms for several years, which is talent. But this year, you know, you and I were just talking, you know, tell us what you're seeing. Like, I'll let, let people hear it from you. Like, what this, you're, this is your expertise. So please, what are you seeing this year that's so drastically different than the years prior? Well, uh, first, I have to tell you, Deneen, that while firms will list talent as the number one challenge or issue they're facing now, and um, AICPA PCPS survey that was definitely number one in almost every single size category. Um, you know, in my opinion, talent should always be number one. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I care deeply about clients and quality service and innovation and a whole bunch of other things. I love marketing and I love technology. I mean, I love it all, but it all starts with talent. If you don't have the right team, you don't have anything else. And so, you know, sometimes firms act like this is like a, the strategy of the minute or something. And that's not exactly the way to have an awesome talent forward firm. Yeah. Um, second, though, yes, talent has never been more challenging than it is right now. And for a whole host of reasons. Uh, number one, obvious reason, the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, totally different ball game in all respects. Um, it's taken our eye off the ball a little bit on the talent management side, the HR side, because our HR people and our management inside firms have been focused on um, really HR policy and remote policy and almost like school nurses a little bit, mm -hmm. um, having to you know get involved in people's uh, positive tests, contact tracing, depending on their state laws. You know, really like having a, a very different job than they had two years ago. And they're still mm -hmm. in it, especially with these federal guidelines. And so our talent management and, and focus on uh, the retention programs, learning and development programs, mm -hmm. uh, recruiting, all those things have been a little bit like uh, the second job, not the day job anymore for a lot of HR people. So that's one reason. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, um, you know, 700,000 people have died and it's caused a whole mm -hmm. bunch of us to uh, assess. And, yeah. uh, and because we could work remotely, a lot of people like you relocated. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've shifted. Uh, we've been working from home. Um, we've enjoyed no commute. And, and we've yeah. got hours of our time back and things like that. And so as the world begins to contemplate post-pandemic uh, reality, what's ending up happening is uh, a lot of talent are thinking, hey, my firm's uh, starting to give signals that they're going to go back to something. They think we're going to change and go back to the way it used to be. And I have no interest in that. Right. And, um, and then a lot of firms woke up to, hey, I can recruit people from anywhere. If we can That's work right. remotely, I can do borderless reach. So what's happened is this big shift in talent. Mm -hmm. People are moving. It's a mobile group. And they're calling it the great resignation or the big quit. Uh, right. You know, the big, um, you know, mix up or shifting of, of talent. But um, I, I think people feel very um, untethered right now. Yeah. And so that yeah. is uh, that just puts firm leaders in a kind of a precarious position. They are. Well, and I, I saw you talk recently and your presentation was titled What Got You Here Is Not Going to Get You There. And that t that title in itself, <laughs> I think, is so spot on. And a couple things you just said is, I think a lot of firms are like, when we get back to normal, well, no, 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 no. Like the world has changed. The pandemic has caused us all to pause and really think about like, what are we doing? What do we want to do in a different way? And and I heard recently that 70% of the talent leaving firms are not going to another firm, which is 
scary. And and also, we have, I, I know from the AICPA and hearing Barry speak for years, we're not getting people into the profession. They're not taking the test. So I think it's like this perfect storm that has caused every, uh, these firms to wake up. And, and you said, need talent focused. Traditionally, they're client focused. It's all about you know doing what the client wants, how the client wants, when the client wants, pricing by the hour. Like, it's like this perfect, perfect storm. So what I'd love for you to share is some strategies that you are either seeing firms do immediately uh, or are recommending firms do immediately. And I should I should say, can we focus on the accounting side? Because that's that's where, you know, CAS is sort of my passion and, and that's where Botkeeper fits. So I'd love to hear some some of those strategies on uh, that you're seeing firms either starting to do or, or be successful at. Well, you you limiting me to accounting is good because um, yeah. I think accounting has the best potential to be progressive, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, not tied to older paradigms or something. Everybody's more open to transformation on the accounting side. Yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, obviously remote blended work, uh, hiring people without borders, uh, really building a remote blended team, figuring out how to do culture, how to do technology, how to do expectations. Um, accessibility, response time, all the things that make a really high functioning remote and blended team, you know, that's high on my priority list. If you have mm -hmm. a, an on-premise office type of operation in a classic sense prior to the pandemic, I am begging you not to mm -hmm. mandate anybody come back to the office for any reason on the accounting side um, for any reason until yeah. at least after May. Uh, let's go to the middle of next year um, we have big, uh, you know, big four accounting firms saying, hey, we're never going to yeah. mandate. Uh, yep. But well, let's just see what happens the middle of the next year. Let's get people boosters. Let's get children immunized. Let's see what happens and, and try to get good and make remote and blended a core competency. Don't just mm -hmm. live with it and sort of cobble it together and mm -hmm. keep sort of making it work. Let's turn it into a competitive advantage. Anytime there are issues, uh, Deneen, or challenges, there are also opportunities. So yes. firms that make that part of their value prop mm -hmm. uh, and say, hey, this makes us unique, special, and different. You can come work for us and you can work from anywhere and you can relocate and we don't care. Um, I think that's a wonderful selling message. That, Botkeeper, that, that was a draw for me because Botkeeper is like, we just want top talent. We don't care where you live. You can live in Alaska. We just want top talent and we want talent that understands firms. And I was attracted to that. And I do travel a lot for work, but I like working from home and I'm surprised because <laughs> um, I like having coffee in the morning and walking my dogs and taking my daughter to school. And I feel like I have, I work a lot. I actually work different hours. You know, I now work after hours. I didn't do that before. I work weekends. I didn't really do that before. So I'm not working less. And Bobby doctor's like, listen, if you've had a bad day, take a long lunch. If you worked all night, sleep in in the morning. And I'm like, wow, this works for me. And I don't think a traditional firm has embraced that yet. Or are you seeing them embrace that? No, we call what you're talking about anytime, anywhere work. And, yeah. uh, and we've been talking about that for 22 years and it's fallen oh. on many, many deaf ears. You know, it's almost <laughs> a frustrating thing to talk about. Um, but uh, but we have clients who've adopted it way before this pandemic. And and that idea, what you were just sitting on is any time work, which is like, hey, I trust you to get your work done. I trust you to meet your goals and objectives. Um, yes, we will have employees who cheat us. Uh, they will cheat us uh, in the cubicle farm right in front of our desk, our mm -hmm. office, just like they would cheat us remotely. But it's very few. Uh, most people are good if we give them the right mission and reason and why and purpose and we really call to them and, and paint a vision together, a shared vision, they're going to, um, they're gonna do their best. And, and so uh, trust is critical, uh, trust your people, treat them with trust and respect. And if, you know, if they have to have a doctor's appointment, that's why we did open PTO. I wasn't gonna nickel and dime right. people. I wasn't, right. I, if they, like you, a, a traditional firm, a, a nine to fiver or whatever, I need a two hour dentist appointment. Okay, you have to use PTO, but then why would I work at night tonight uh, to catch up on my stuff? You know, because you docked me two hours of my time off and this bank of time and, and really like yeah. acting like people uh, should be limited there doesn't make sense. Well, and when I saw you 
but seek or I someone challenged you and I loved your answer. So I'd love for you to share because someone said, you know, staff just isn't as loyal virtually. And, you know, when they're virtual, they don't, you know, they're quitting right during tax season or right before tax season and before no one did that before. And you were like, is that your problem or their problem? And I was like, I was like, oh yes. Like who's 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 responsible for that? Well, so in all of these challenges that we have right now, and it's a complex, complex thing mm -hmm. to run a business today, okay? So I, I get that we as business owners and leaders, we could really you know, put our face in our hands and really be like, holy mackerel, this market is killing me. Or we could say, oh my gosh, with all this challenge comes opportunity and I'm 100% responsible for how I'm going mm -hmm. to manage it. And, and my leadership team and I are gonna keep trying new things keep, mm -hmm. uh, we'll stop old things that maybe don't work, we're gonna start new things, but I'm gonna be responsible. And loyalty is a perfect example. You can blame clients or you can blame talent for their lack of loyalty. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, hey man, if I was in creating that stickiness and loyalty, if I was creating the relationships and really caring about my people, then they wouldn't be leaving. And there is an old adage, you and I've heard this adage a million times, it's been around forever, People don't quit their company, they quit their boss. Yeah. And they so don't quit their boss. Did. Yeah, they don't quit their boss because they're mean. Some bosses are mean, but mostly we quit our boss because they don't care. We don't feel like they <laughs> care. They don't know us, they don't care. Yes. So yeah. That's why we quit. And I, I think at accounting firms, it, it traditionally has been like, get the work done, your global hours, take care of the customer, customer, customer. And they're not spending time, you know, with it. I think that the, the, the accountant type person isn't necessarily a people person, they're a numbers person. And so I think in this remote environment, they're having a harder time connecting and they're used to people coming in the office and connecting with each other naturally. So managers didn't have to manage the way they need to manage now. And it's just a hard shift uh, uh, to make. But, uh, you know, again, I'd love to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to talk about all the things wrong. I'd love to hear some strategies from you that you can share to yeah. some of these new things, you know, that they can try that are working. That's that, that's easy to do now, maybe. You cracked me up just now because you said, um, you said that they, you know, would run into people naturally. And I'm going to say that they would run into people accidentally, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, we can't leave anything to chance anymore. And when you right. have a remote blended workforce or really even an in-person workforce, I don't care what workforce you have or how you structure, we have to be super intentional these days. Mm -hmm. um, and especially on the relational side, I don't think my boss cares. Well, if I'm the leader, I'm going to make sure you know I care. How right. I'm going to spend time with you. Right. So in, a, in a, an environment where we feel like we have no time, and we owe tons of deliverables to people, we can easily right. cut staff meetings, not have one-on-ones, not stop mm -hmm. and say, hey, how are you really? What's working over there? What's not working and how can I help you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't wanna, you know, we're too busy. And and then you won't, you, you won't be too busy when it comes time to recruit to replace their position. You'll have, to, you'll have to have interviews with strangers instead of mm -hmm. stopping and intentionally meeting with your people. Right. And that, that was another thing I actually heard you say where you're like, hey guys, listen, everybody wants an accountant <laughs> and, and they don't want to come to the profession. Like you've got to change so that, you know, we're not going to, we're not attracting Tom talent. But on top of that, you can't service your clients if you don't have talent to service your clients. So we have to be talent focused um, to be, and that was another, you, you gave some strategies on what to do now. Um, firing clients oh well, why don't you share yes. you know because yep. there's a there's a there's a, a little bit of a panic happening uh and so you know instead of panicking i would like to hear sort of you need some great strategies to to recommend that people prefer so first just make talent your number one priority mm -hmm. okay number two uh make it intentional to meet with your people on a regular basis and if you are too large an organization for a single leader to meet with, because some of our accounting firms are small enough to do that. As we scale, make sure that we have real clarity about which one of us is assigned to which people. And so mm -hmm. we're not hoping everybody's meeting with everyone. We're very clear that Jennifer is meeting with uh, Deneen and Della mm -hmm. and Grace or whatever, and that way those meetings are happening. 
and 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 clarify expectations. Um, so both check in and build those relationships. Uh, intentional fun, intentional cultural fun. Make it happen, even though you feel too busy to do it. Be careful. Manage your yeses. So um, this idea that I'm too busy to help you because I have too many client deliverables means I said too many yeses. And so we have to reprioritize and we all have to say more no's, more no's. And we'll have to also uh, consider getting rid of or cutting some of the yeses, which means calling clients and, yes. um, and not renewing clients and really looking hard at right sizing our capacity. Uh, Deneen, I was in a room full of uh, tax partners uh, yesterday, a big room full of tax uh, leaders, and we were talking about motivation and engagement and how to retain people, because people are worried about this. And, uh, and they went around the rooms and shared all kinds of ideas of how they do spot bonuses, and they give wow notes and appreciation and personal thank yous. And, and at one point, uh, a, a man stood up and essentially said, hey, hey, wait a minute, all these are great ideas, but I have an idea. How about we have enough people to do the work. And, and that means we get rid of some of the work so that the capacity fits, so we don't right. work our people like dogs right. relentlessly forever. And that yeah. will show them that we care. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a strategy, and that's a strategy that I, that firms scares them because because they're afraid to let clients go they're afraid to let wrong clients go those wrong clients are a drain on everything resources emotions and but that's not it's always it, that's not just been the way and i think that's a huge we could probably we could talk about that for hours like you probably have a session just on how to right size right fit um, and the impact that it has on your people to say, hey, listen, I'm listening to you. I do not like the way that customer talked to you. And I do not like the expectations that they have. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna let that customer go. I think the loyalty that I would have if I was a you know a, a staff accountant, it would go far. It would go really far. But it's a really hard thing to do for especially firms. Well, and I wrote an article for the Journal of Accountancy. It was published two weeks ago. Um, you could find it. Uh, you can include yeah. it in your links uh, for sure. resources if you want, but also people could just Google it. Uh, it's uh, it's about right-sizing or culling your client base. Um, now is the time uh, to fire clients. And it's a seller's market for accounting services. Uh, accounting resources are scarce. Your clients cannot find them either, and they can't keep them. They don't know how to train them. They don't know how to keep them. They'd rather have you do it. They just want to outsource their accounting to you. And so we could sell outsourced accounting all day long. And that yeah. means that we don't have to put up with clients who treat right. us poorly, don't pay, slow pay, or uh, nickel and dime us, don't value us. Um, and also we can right size the client base or the client projects to fit our current capacity, then recruit more people and then sell more clients. Uh, so that we can give our people hope. When you start to cut clients, when you're overwhelmed, your staff think, uh-oh, my leaders get it. They're onto it. They mm -hmm. care about me. They care enough to do something hard and scary to help kind of ease and balance our workload so that we can have real lives. And mm -hmm. when you give your people those kind of signals, when you're willing to try scary things to mm -hmm. help elevate their lives, their loyalty deepens. Right, right. Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, another strategy is not only calling clients, which I do want to read that article, so please share it with us and we will post it. <laughs> um, but I also automate. I mean, that's that's where, especially in the accounting side, like as I've been talking and, I, and I've been in this cast space for over 13 years and the reason I came to Botkeeper is I very, interested in AI. I think AI is the future and we are a way firms can get a lift or at least, you know, people are drowning and trying to get the books done by the 15th. And what I've been learning since I've been here is no one wants to do bookkeeping. No one really wants to do bookkeeping. No one really wants to do bill pay. No one really wants to do payroll. And if the firms don't want to do it, guess what? The clients don't want to do it. So as I've been here and I've been talking to firms, they're turning business away because they're at capacity. So they're saying no to new business. I'm like, well, we are a way you could say yes to the business. You don't have to hire more talent. You can use more technology. And, and, and you know, I, it's like, 
to your point, there's more businesses than bookkeepers. Businesses can't keep a bookkeeper. Firms can't keep a bookkeeper. And so automate, automate, automate. Technology is an answer. Uh, and so are you seeing, I mean, I know I'm seeing it, but just as you're out there consulting with firms and talking with firms, how are they thinking about technology and integrating the technology into their strategy? Well, so, um, you know, I would say that there's kind of two, uh, two firms or maybe three. One that when we talk about CAS, they say, what? Um, that, that one yeah. you and I don't need to talk about right now, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll put those off to the left. Then, then, then the second kind is the, the tribe, the small tribe mm -hmm. of CAS, you know, um, zealots who get automation. They get focus on a technology stack, only support a couple mm -hmm. GLs, you know, really uh, streamline efficiency. Clients adapt to our way of, of delivering the service, not we adapt to theirs. Um, you know, uh, just that whole, the tribe, uh, and it's a small tribe. It's not as big as it needs to be. Then there's a whole nother group of people who are out there trying to do client accounting or they're doing mm -hmm. bookkeeping or they're, yeah. they're still kind of mired in what I'll call the legacy of this uh, service line. And they, they're supporting everybody's accounting software and they're still trading data files and stuff yeah. on sticks. And, you know, there's like uh, that, that group of people, they, they need to drink the Kool-Aid and understand automation. Mm -hmm. Um, a good friend of mine and yours, Samantha Mansfield, who works mm -hmm. on our team, wrote a blog on our blog last week that was, okay, everybody keeps saying, where will I find people? And she said, I think we're asking the wrong question in this blog. She said, my question is, what can we automate? Yeah. You know, not where can I find people? What can we automate? Right. And so I loved that blog. It was, she called it reframing the issue. And so it good. is, we, and I, I think we have to do both, of course, you know, so, sure. uh, but it's goofy just to keep trying to throw human resources at something that could be automated. There's no question. Right, right. Well, and so let's shift just a little bit to CAS, because you brought up CAS, and, yeah. you know, I've been doing CAS for a long time, but kind of like you've been talking about talent for a long time. I've been calling, talking about CAS a long time, and it still, like, makes me want to go, oh, my gosh, CAS, what's CAS? I mean, how can you not... <laughs> No, what you know, but anyway, um, you know, it's hard changing. I, I really, I'm not dissing on anybody. I know change is hard, and I think you know the title of your session is "What Got Us Here." What got us here? The way firms have traditionally done it has been very profitable, and so why do they have to change something that's always worked? But to your point, is it's not gonna keep working. Things have definitely changed, and you've got to get your head on the sand and start trying these new things. And so um, you and I have worked together on the CPA.com CAS benchmark uh, survey, and you just completed a second survey, and I know we're gonna, you're going to be doing a third. Uh, and so can I hear from you, because I read the results, um, and so, but I'd love to hear from you some of those key findings, because to your point earlier, too, CAS is the area that firms that are focusing on is having the fastest growth. Uh, and so that is the place that we can build and change and, and, and really automate to grow and scale yeah. and grow. So anyway. Yes. Well, and I call, so, so Kaz, by the way, uh, in case anybody hears this and thinks you and I are being, um, you know, coy or something, <laughs> Kaz is client advisory services or client advisory and accounting services or accounting and advisory, but it's, it's for an expanded way of looking at accounting services that it's right. not just transaction processing, it's not just the back end, it's not just a financial statement, it's also a whole set of advisory around it that helps the clients be more successful. It becomes a true business advisor, really getting in there with management and helping them lead better businesses. And mm -hmm. a lot of CAS practices, Deneen, were sort of first responders during this pandemic, coming in and Absolutely. really helping, really, that was one of the findings, you know, really helping clients mm -hmm. with PPP uh, loan prep and, uh, you know, an ERC uh, credit calculation, um, employee retention credit uh, calculation, and other things needed to help keep these clients afloat during this terrifically challenging time. And so that's one thing. Uh, CAS mm -hmm. practices on the whole, 111 uh, uh, firms surveyed in that survey that you mentioned, the AICPACPA.com CAS benchmark study, um, 111 uh, uh, CAS practices participated. And um, the median, of those 111 grew their practice 20% year over year, which is you know not only double digit growth, which is more than most CPA firms and most of the other benchmark studies grew overall, 
Okay. Um, you know, they grew in single digits, like six to eight percent on the average. Most of the survey showed, and CAS grew at twenty on the median. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, they also had margins ranging from like thirty-four to forty percent. And uh, and and average CPA firm margins in most benchmark studies today are um, at thirty or under thirty percent. And so it's a fast-growing practice. It's a profitable practice, but yeah. not the traditional way where we. Right. Support everybody's GL and and we uh, you know let partners price it and they could give it away for free if they wanted and uh, you know not that way of running that that's the old kind of a legacy bookkeeping um, after the fact model or something CAS is is run and it and it showed that the top performing firms they support fewer than three GLs they invest more in training they dedicate okay. resources if they're part of a CPA firm they dedicate resources to the accounting group so they're not sharing them with other groups. Mm -hmm. which is cool. Can I talk about that? Well, I yeah, just want to dig into that. <laughs> that. So I used to uh, go to a lot of the firms that were trying to build CAS, and I would go to the CAS leader, not always a partner, or they're a half a tax partner, or half an audit auto partner, was trying to you know internally educate. And so I would say, let me come, let me talk to the partners, let me talk to the managing partner. And I would ask, I would say to the managing partner, you know, what growth are you seeing in CAS? And they would say, oh, you know, 15, 20% growth. I'm like, what growth are you seeing in tax and audit? Oh, you know, 5% in audit or flat in audit, 5% tax. I'm like, okay, wait. So CAS has had 20, 15 to 20% growth and you don't have a dedicated leader to CAS? Your fastest growing you know, it doesn't have a partner in charge. So when will you put a dedicated partner? Oh, I'm like, do you need to have a million to dedicate a partner? And then when will you have your second cast partner? Is it three million? And when will you have your third cast partner? Is it five million? And they'd be like, oh. And I don't, why? Like, why, why do you think, is it just because it's a new division? Or why do you think they're not dedicating resources to the fast, like this area that they're everyone's talking about and is bringing in the revenue right now? Well, I've said this for a while and people don't like to hear it, but this this the services legacy doesn't have no. um, it doesn't have a positive reputation. Right. Let's yeah. it's, uh, well. it's it's misunderstood and sort of marginalized. And and I the perfect example is that we call some of the accountants that deliver the service if they're non-certified, some firms still call them para professionals. Mm. And the word para the the, uh, the the prefix there a para is um is means less than or half of so half a professional mm -hmm. or less than professional um so you know you were a bookkeeper and you weren't certified so you were less than those services were seen as less than and so mm -hmm. when uh when firms decide to start up and really do cas the way it's supposed to be it's a consulting service ladies and gentlemen it's mm -hmm. an advisory service it's i wish yeah. i i haven't looked up the greek for more than or double but maybe that's what we should <laughs> yeah. I, i'm going to look that up by the way and i'm going to start saying that that i want double professional yeah. or more than a professional or something because um who cares if they're certified as long as they're competent to deliver the service and the advice and then right. um and we can attract certified people to this uh service line if we stop the stigma that it's the bookkeeping department. Clients don't want to pay for bookkeeping. Right. They don't. No. They don't want to pay for bookkeeping. They don't value it, and neither do firms. But right. we still have to do the transaction processing. Somebody does either that, or we outsource yeah. it, or whatever. But and I um, believe the firms can own it, and 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 especially since they've come to Bookkeeper, the way we think about data and the oh. power of the data, and firms have all this transactional data, and so they have the power in this information to really be able to help this small business owner in a totally different way. And when they can, you know, make meaning of a client's numbers and spark conversations and give different scenarios. I mean, talk about loyalty. These customers and the businesses that I think firms want are hungry for it. It might not be your traditional pizza shop that's a cash based business for the last 30 years, but the ones that are booming and growing during this pandemic, those are the ones that are hungry to be real time in the cloud, talking to their advisor. Uh, and so that's where I, I, I can see the ones that are focusing on it and dedicating resources to it and using talent for it are thriving. And I think it's exciting. So 
I guess I hear what you're saying. It's still the ugly stepsister in a lot of people's minds. It's not what people, you know, they don't think people want to come out of college and do bookkeeping. Well, they're right. But people want to come out of college using technology to give business advice. And so that's the, and that's transform your lives, transform business owners lives to do what yeah. they don't do well and to help them manage money and, and manage growth and manage costs and really envision a future that's profitable and right. and thriving, you know, to, to really make a difference for clients. That's what the service is. And so it, it just has a bad brand, if you will, the old service does. And right. uh, most firms that have real success, they find a next gen leader who gets it mm -hmm. and they put that person in charge and they start rebranding internally, which you have to do like, and say, this is who we are and this is who we are not. Right. Uh, whenever I teach to an audience that's never heard about CAS, I say, this is what CAS is. And I make a list of things and then I say, let me tell you what CAS is not. Yeah. I, and I think that for them to really understand, they do have to understand what it's not before we can really level set to then talk about, okay, let's talk about what it is and what it can be and why it's thriving. Well, I'm going to end. It's four o'clock on the dot. And I think that's great because we're ending on a high note instead of the, you know, like capacity more for talent. We're ending on a really high note and there's so much opportunity still. Uh, and so thank you for the work that you do. Uh, and thank you for your time today. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.